One of the biggest misconceptions people have about celebrating black history is that we only need to address the big names, the big wigs. You know, the people whose ambitious and hard fought efforts brought about huge press coverage, legislative change, and or an assassination. They're awesome, but what about some other black heroes who maybe worked quietly without much fanfare, don't get mentioned in the textbooks except for a footnote, or who failed in their efforts but left behind principles or ideas to admire? Here's five you may not know. Dorothy Porter was born in 1904 to a middle-class Virginia family and graduated from Howard in 1928. She went on to earn a master's from Columbia in library science in 1932. She could have chilled after the accomplishment of being the first black person to graduate from Columbia's library program, but instead she took her degree and did something extraordinary with it. She grew the research center at Howard as chief librarian. For 43 years, she collected priceless books, documents, and other important texts, photos, and oral histories that detailed the black experience. The collection held over 130,000 cataloged items by the time of her retirement, an amazing increase from the roughly 3,000 volumes in the collection when Miss Porter first started. It's even more impressive considering Miss Porter had a tight budget and limited resources compared to research centers at white institutions. If she hadn't collected these works for future scholars to study and reference, they could have ended up lost or destroyed. <laughs> Garveyites will especially appreciate this man. Pat was born in Tennessee as a slave around 1809 and spent most of his early life trying to escape. He finally seceded in 1846 while in his 30s. He began traveling as an abolitionist and advocate for black rights. After the Civil War, along with a partner, he established a real estate association in 1874 to get black people land around Tennessee. Local white people weren't having it, so Pat began considering orchestrating a mass exodus of southern blacks to immigrate out west, where plenty of land was open and unclaimed. In 1879, he established Dunlap Colony in Kansas that had 2,400 black settlers from the south. This was a part of a bigger movement of exodusters, and by 1879, at least 50,000 black people had moved out west, some directly influenced by Pat. Whites in these areas were angry, and the federal government began an investigation. After testifying before the U.S. Senate about how successful Dunlap Colony was, along with defending the Exoduster movement, thousands of poor blacks flooded the area and put a strain on resources. Even though the colony ultimately failed, its year of success was due to a former slave who never learned to read or write. During the last 20 years of Singleton's life, he continued pressing for black independence. He established a short-lived organization to combine the resources of black people to create businesses and schools. And when it disintegrated after initial promise, Singleton came to identify with the Back to Africa movement until his death. I really admire Pap's resilience and perseverance, both recurring themes in his life. <laughs> Bessie and her twin sister Sarah were born in Raleigh, North Carolina in 1891 to a former slave. She grew up sheltered on St. Augustine's campus where she graduated from in 1911. Even still, she had a fiery spirit. Later describing breaking Jim Crow laws, saying about drinking from whites only water fountains, I just take a drink of the white water. It didn't taste any different. She spent time traveling the South as a teacher before earning enough money to attend Columbia University, where she graduated in 1923 for dentistry. She became just the second black woman to practice dentistry in the state of New York and made her services available for cheap to all of the black community in Harlem. She did $2 teeth cleanings and $5 fillings for a long 27 years, even as dentist service prices rose. In 1993, she and her sister co-wrote a New York Times best-selling book, Having Our Say, when they were 101 years old. It is the virtue of service to one's community that I admire most about Miss Delaney. How can you help black people in your own lane? <laughs> Chicagoans, you might know him. He was born in the early 18th century, likely in St. Domingo, Haiti, or another Caribbean island. By the mid-1780s, Sable was a married frontier tradesman, described as handsome and well-educated. By 1790, he permanently settled on the north bank of the Chicago River and sold goods to people coming down it, making him wealthy and respected. Around his location, other permanent settlements popped up, making him the first non-indigenous citizen of the yet-to-be-named Chicago, basically the city's founder. 
In the year 1800, he sold his land, which had grown to include multiple buildings and a log cabin decked out in fancy furnishings and paintings for a pretty penny. This is cool because as you know, Chicago would grow to be a central location of black people and culture during the 20th century after the Great Migration. She was born in Charleston, South Carolina in 1898 to lower class parents. She grew up during the nadir of American race relations and experiencing, witnessing, and hearing about violence and discrimination firsthand inspired Septima Clark for the rest of her life. Her parents took special care to send her off to school so she could become literate. She became a teacher and got a master's from Hampton University. In 1919, the same year of the infamously bloody Red Summer, she joined the Charleston branch of the NAACP. One of her first wins was obtaining 10,000 signatures door to door to get black teachers and principals the right to work at Charleston Public Schools, which came to fruition the following year. She was a respected teacher at various schools, including the illustrious Booker T. Washington High School in Columbia. She continued volunteering with the NAACP in her free time. In 1956, South Carolina made it illegal for state and city employees to align themselves with civil rights organizations. Two years earlier, Ms. Clark had begun teaching literacy and NAACP workshops around Tennessee. Being literate aided potential black voters in keeping up with the news and filling out necessary forms. Because Septima Clark continued working for the NAACP, she was promptly fired from her teaching position and lost her pension. She was not deterred in her work though. Along with her cousin, field supervisor for adult education through the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Bernice Robinson, they enlarged the adult learning program into citizenship schools. These schools were often held secretly in homes or the back of businesses for black adults who wanted to gain literacy and learn civics. Citizenship schools became so popular across the South that a bigger budget was needed, and in 1961, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference took over. Miss Clark noted sexism within the Civil Rights Movement, and by 1970, she had gone her separate ways from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Even though many don't know her name, Septima Clark was dedicated to empowering black people through literacy and was an integral part of the Civil Rights Movement. 